Let's kick it off in China. I, I'm drawn to the very first line in your notes, which is that U.S.-China trade, total trade is becoming less important to China. But perhaps there are specifics uh, that, that Trump still has some leverage to pull. Yeah, well, of course, he has a lot of leverage to go with. Uh, the, the important relationship is still there. Uh, China is as important for the U.S. as is uh, the U.S. to China. But it has been changing. We just saw the export and import numbers. Exports are still up, 7.5%, 7, 7 but imports are so much more important now, uh, growing by 17%. China is really still rebalancing from being an export-oriented industry country into a more consumption-based, broader-based uh, domestic economy. Hey, and you can see that in the numbers. So from that perspective, global trade to them is still very important. It's still the cornerstone of the whole economic surge they've seen over the last few decades. But it's going forward, it's much more about financial reform, one belt, one road, uh, a cleaner environment. So it's changing uh, very much. And, and that is going to have an impact on this relationship and on the negotiations that we're going to see the next few days. Yeah, so Olaf, when you're looking to develop a strategy around Chinese assets and trying to tap into the rise of the, uh, of the middle class and the consumer society in China, how do you set about doing that, given the constraints that the Chinese have put on themselves around the environment and on deleveraging the financial services sector? So what's the best way to play this? Currently, we are mainly uh, looking at financial, so we are overweight in some of the banking positions. Uh, we do have uh, an, an asset manager in China that's also focusing on the local market. So there's multiple ways we are looking at this. Uh, and for now, it's actually looking pretty attractive, especially, for instance, the banks in China are very cheap. They are very cheap I I indeed. Um, one thing that we are looking at, these are some of the bank stocks that we're showing to our viewers at the moment. Um, th th there, is, there are moves afoot in Congress, perhaps, to, to slap Iran-style sanctions on some of the Chinese banks. Um, what risk does that prove? Our last guest, our last CIO, suggested that that risk uh, potentially is on the domestic economy, but the numbers have been quite strong internally in China. Yeah, if you look at China, it, it is very much and has become more of a uh, leveraging story. There has been a lot of debt that's been pushed into the economy. You've seen that in the property sector over the last few few years. So it is very much a policy instrument to the Chinese government uh, to stimulate the economy or cool it down. Um, we've we've heard all these stories about trade sanctions and and President Trump being more uh, firm on Chinese trade policy. Uh, but if you look at the real numbers, then there, there haven't been that many trade sanctions over the last few months. Like actually, the last years, it actually has been worse than it is now. So, uh, yes, there will be a lot of talk. Uh, there will be a lot of pressure on it. Uh, but it's very much still a Chinese policy instrument. So I, I wouldn't expect too much coming out of it from, from the U.S. government. So I guess then, Olaf, you don't attach too high a probability to the world's two largest economies entering into a destructive trade war. I ask that because we spoke to the NAB chief economist uh, over the last 24 hours who uh, applies a one in five probability of that happening, but says it is a big worry for him. Um, what kind of probability do you attract to, uh, attach to a big trade war? I think it's very low. It is a big worry because if it would happen, that would have massive influences all across the world, but not more than one in 10 uh, from my perspective. 